Now we move to our 15.30 slot. I'm sorry we're running about 12 minutes late. Uh, it's not always so easy keeping the virtual stuff on time. Uh, and even when we're here in the room, we, have, we get very interested in some of the subjects. Uh, we still have quite a substantial audience online, so don't feel that you're alone here in the room. <laughs> we're very comfortable with carrying on and uh, enjoying this, the afternoon. Our session now is restructuring travel and tourism businesses to lower debt exposure with new strategic investments to return to profitability onto the profitability path. And it'll be conducted in the form of a conversation. And I'm very pleased to welcome back to the stage Mark Beer, OBE, Chairman of the Metis Institute and Gerald Lawless, Director of ITIC and WTTC Ambassador. And joining us online from Dubai is Dinky Puri, who is the founding partner of Eagle Wing Group. Gentlemen, if I can invite you to the stage. They're just getting their final microphone again. And will be with us in a minute or less as Gerald sprints to the stage, <laughs> all ready to go. And no doubt you've organized between the three of you how you're going to run the conversation. Yes. Yep. No, so we're welcome, ready. Mark. Welcome, Gerald. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Dinky. I'll sit here, actually, in yep. front of Dinky then. No, I mean, if you <laughs> 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 yes, if you think of me, knew what we were doing. Puri online. Welcome, Dinky. So what we've agreed to do is that I will uh, act more or less as the moderator, the referee, and uh, we will get these two experts to talk to us about this. The title of the, uh, of, the, of the session is Restructuring Travel and Tourism Businesses to Lower Debt Exposure with New Strategic Investments to Return to Profitability Path. Well, that's uh, quite a mouthful. and. Uh, if I may, for a change, we start with our, our virtual uh, participant, with Dinky Puri from uh, my, I suppose, hometown of Dubai. Uh, Dinky, very welcome. And we'd like very much to hear, you know, what, what, what you are thinking about this particular topic, about this uh, subject, because I know that you are very involved. And maybe tell us a little bit about yourself uh, to begin, and then we can uh, talk about the actual subject. Well, the subject at large is very important, especially in light of what's happened in the industry with COVID. Uh, my personal reading is that a travel airline leisure will come back. It's coming back and it will always be there. The marriage uh, between the institutions, lenders uh, and investors have got to get softer terms. Now, some would say, the industry must perform in order to get institutions to lend and support them going forward to lower the debt ceiling. Uh, I, I would agree with that, but at the very outset, it's all about the economy coming back into play. So, the t personally, I think uh, as much as the governments soften their uh, inducement policies with respect to fixed costs, uh, give and also structure loans uh, and funds like Saudi has done to inject into tourism projects. That is an important way forward for the industry. However, banks and financial institutions require to take a long-term view and soften the lending terms. Where the initial or the previous lending patterns of short-term 10 to 15 year or 10 year terms at high interest rates would not add any value to the industry. The institutions need to take a view, believing that uh, countries and domains which are highly tourism driven will come back, needed to be supported through long-term funding of a minimum of 20 years with softer terms. Uh, and that's where I think uh, institutions need to take a position, back the industry, knowing that this is something that is going to happen 
it's going to come back, and especially in countries which are highly tourism driven. Uh, so big picture, softer terms, longer rate, longer lending, and standing by qualified investors in the industry. And what would you say, the, uh, for example, in the United Arab Emirates, what kind of government involvement was there in relation to the bank's approach to, uh, to loans and uh, interest rates during the COVID lockdowns particularly, and as things have evolved? Uh, I think the UAE at large has done a very good job. They, they, the bridging loans, they extended it. They went back with qualified investors, re refinanced restructured their, their loan payments, government induced uh, a substantial amount of benefits, whether it's in electrical tariffs, whether it's in ownership, uh, onshore, offshore, getting rid of uh, supporting um, uh, investors to stand individually uh, without any sponsorships. So I think the government's taken a pretty active role in supporting it. Now, let's go to Saudi Arabia as they open up the economy and go away from or from natural resources of oil and look at sec, uh, look at tourism as a major sector they've got five or six institutions the tourism fund and banks to stand back and fund them to a tourism fund at qualified projects and i think this is truly valued because that's that's standing behind the industry and supporting them long term and uh, thanks for that, uh, Dinky. And I think that from earlier conversations, we have uh, quite an opposing view from my colleague here from Mark, or maybe not. Well, I could have an opposing view if the audience <laughs> would like me to have an opposing view. But of course, it's natural to ask for governments to extend soft loans. But there are many hands seeking not that many funds. And of course it's natural. When I built hedge funds in Switzerland for some years, every time you build a hedge fund, every country's got a reason why the term should be softer for that country. But you don't succeed in commerce if you listen to the sales force telling you why commissions should be higher and pricing should be lower. In fact, you weed out the weak in finance and you focus, unfortunately, on those that are committed to making the most profit. So in the real world, financial institutions are not interested in extending soft loans. And I like the title here, Invest, Finance, Restart. But to a financier, the answer would be restart. Then you invest, and then I will finance. But why does the vision have to be so narrow? Why can't uh, government, why can't financiers see? Well, this organization is in a tough time today, but it's definitely got, it's well worth supporting. Surely that happens as well. Well, and I think governments do do that. And I no, think not just make government, a but also institutions, banks, etc. But, but their shareholders say get the maximum return for the lowest risk. And I suppose this is the three points I wanted to make on this topic. First is, so often in the hospitality sector, we don't speak the same language as the financier. To succeed in hospitality, you have to care about the crispness of the croissant. You have to care about the hue of the lighting in the lobby and the guest experience and how comfortable the carpet is. But it's not a language that finance understands. Talk to me about debt cover. Talk to me about volatility. Talk to me about margin. Talk to me about risk. And it's only when the hospitality sector talks the same language as finance I think, does finance start to understand? Well, well, the well I'd have to interject there. I mean, yes, I, I come from to. a hotel background. Um, we ran lots of different hotels. And we did speak the same language. Yes, we did serve crisp croissant. And of course, they were very nice. And if they weren't, <laughs> you wouldn't have any revenue in the first place. So therefore, the financial institutions wouldn't be interested. But we did our profit and loss accounts. We did our, we, we did our balance sheets. We certainly did our projections. We raised money. We raised loans. So, you know, wh why do you say the, the hotel industry doesn't speak the same language? Well, I think a lot, I mean, you, of course, did, Gerald. You securitized your future revenues. Uh, uh, one of the ways in which to get softer loans is to provide some security over future revenues and the asset base. Unse you did unsecured, that. actually. Uh, well, you secured it through <laughs> Cayman, if you remember. So you secured it as part of a holding company securitization. Mm -hmm. And it's using those clever mechanisms to de-risk the volatility. But not many 
um, hotel. Uh, no, um, but even at a more basic level, it, it's still, I, I don't see why if somebody wants to build a hotel, develop a hotel, get financing for a hotel, that uh, you wouldn't expect that they would be able to speak and explain what they want to do in financial terms. Yes, I think they should, and I think that's, that's the point. With the, the, the question was, what innovative uses could we have, firstly, to get out of a critical situation? Indeed. And then, how might we look going forward to, yeah. to, to finance, right? So, I mean, you know, quite often, when you see a hotel group in crisis, it constantly tries to weather the storm. Mm -hmm. But if we look at, um, say, the Dubai world restructure, or we look at the restructure of many airlines and hospitality companies, sometimes you just need to go through a formal restructuring process, get rid of the legacy debt, get rid of the legacy pain, and start again with new finance in an innovative way. But, but it's easy to, easy to think, I'll just keep going, it will get better, I'll ask for some support from government, I'll ask for an extension of the loans to the banks, instead of getting to the point where you say, I tell you what, restart, invest and finance. So restart, would you say, in some places, shut the place down until you figure out how to make some money out of it? Yeah. <laughs> Dinky, what do you think? Um, tell us a bit more about what you do in, uh, in the region. Well, I, I hear what Mark said, but I would disagree with the very notion of shutting a business down at the end of the day. Hotels are not business that you can shut, shut down bricks and mortar and convert it into something else. The, the key here, but I, although I do agree with you that lenders and institutions want to make the money, but it's that principle or financial institution saying my money is the last money in, the first money out at a 10 at a ten year term with high interest rates, that won't work. That doesn't support the industry. We're a service industry employing millions and thousands of people around the world. We've got to get them back knowing that we are ready for people to travel. And that's where I come back with softer terms and longer bridging to, uh, tones, institutions and banks are made a core business is lending. Now, take a long-term view, support the economy at large, go behind the institutions who you believe are bona fide in nature. If need be, let, the, it, let banks and institutions have, board, have their members sitting on disbursements in order to avoid uh, any form of leakage in the system. But bottom line is, that this is one industry which is capital intensive, human intensive, knowing that it's going to remain there forever and ever. And uh, unlike the belt industry that you could close shop, put, the, put it on a container and ship it to another country, you just can't do it. You can't do it in, in, the, in this business. I am, I believe softer terms, a little bit of a liberal attitude with institutions to stand by the travel and hospitality industry, especially in domains that are, are a thrive on tourism. They're bound to come back. So my plea is inst banks and institutions need to take a better view. Uh, pension funds have got money available. People want to deploy it at the end of the day. If you get a three, four, five percent return against a 0.5 percent of keeping your money in a in a in a, in a saving in a safe deposit, it's a no-brainer that I'll go and put my money into something that people are going to be coming in, in into that business. So answer is. As governments restructure, open up economies, get the engine rooms working again, get employees coming back into play, institutions need to do their job of softer terms and longer ending. Well, well it, you know, it comes back to your view of uh, private sector. Is it up to the private sector to support uh, with softer terms and, and uh, to support the, the employment of, of people. And, and many would say, yes, they're meant to be a utility and that's what they're there for. But I think if you talk to people in the sector, they'd say there's many people asking them for, for money and they've got to invest based on risk-weighted returns. And, and that's what they do. So I, I, you know, I think the, the only place of, of unity is likely to be either specialist funds, um, which are set up particularly for the tourism sector, mm -hmm. into which long-term money might go. And, and to some extent it talks, I, I, I agree, to diversify. I mean, don't put all your eggs in one basket. There's a lovely story of um, a bunch of Swiss bankers and they went out to Saudi Arabia to talk to the ruling family in Saudi Arabia. And they said, listen, you're all, uh, you're totally invested in the kingdom. And the family said, yes. They said, well, you see, we know as bankers that you shouldn't keep all your eggs in one basket. To which the response was, what if you own the basket? And I think 
uh, joke aside, when you're looking at financing, when a hospitality sector is looking at financing, if it only goes to a single sector for borrowing, say the traditional banking sector, therefore it's going to find itself in, in, in difficulty in order to get the best returns, diversify the borrowing. So I agree with Dinky, go to the pension funds and say, we'd like 20% of our borrowing from pension funds, 20% from debt, maybe some mezzanine, maybe a little bit of equity, collateralize against the asset if you can get the owner to give you collateral against the asset, securitize future revenues if you've got a track record, even possibly go to your management company and say, you lend some money, put some skin in the game and lend some money into the uh, operation. Well, well that, that's an area that I'd love to tease out a bit between both of you is the role of the management companies in relation to the overall asset. I mean, always the, the owner feels that the the management company just cares about the evolution and the development of the brand. And then when they have too many, too many, too many hotels under the one brand, they dream up another brand and they build hotels next door to the hotel where they don't have a territorial exclusivity for that particular new brand. And uh, Dinky, you must come across a lot of this uh, as you talk to owners uh, <coughs> around the region <coughs> and in what you're doing. What, what do you say? Well, that, that's something which does the owners bring up and does, it does bother them. Now, I personally be believe that the brands have been hearing this from owners and they've also, uh, they're addressing these issues. They, they today are finding themselves more accountable to owning companies uh, whilst they grow the brand. And as consolidation at brand levels happen, they are being held to perform, uh, to perform better. If ever anything happened, for the right reasons was COVID, where brands had a de uh, had a de uh, de uh, cut costs, re-energized their thinking and, and a way they work. So a lot of fat was un was trimmed. Uh, efficiencies came into play. I think owners, um, you know, gave discounts or induced people of not charging their fees. They've realized that without the owner and guests coming to the property and performing, they, the brand, uh, brand's got a problem. So brands today realize more than ever that they've got a partner in an equitable partnership with the owner at the end and institutions at large, because institutions and lenders have put the heat on uh, to ensure that uh, all brands uh, uh, uplift their performance and do a little bit more than they were casually doing. Now. Gerald, you, uh, you know that and you've addressed a major point that if you are with a particular brand, they've got 20 hotels in that city and you're 21 on the line, how do, who, who do you really serve better than the other? All these issues about clustering and location premiums uh, are, you know, are questionable. So you've got you've to gotta drive the brands and that's where I think institutions, uh, people like all of us, like asset managers, etc., uh, try and hold a qualified discussion to ensure that eventually enhancement of revenue and higher performance levels and flow through take place. And I think, to be fair, brands have re-engineered the way they operate. Uh, would you suggest to owners that they demand that uh, part of that re-engineering also entails the uh, brands putting some skin in the game, as they say? Indeed, yes. And I think brands initially did it only where they couldn't get a positioning, they would go and bind themselves to contract or soften their terms. But today I think brands realize that they gotta do much more in terms of investment. Because a lot, as you know, a lot of brands today are sitting on uh, capital that's either been borrowed to grow the brand and they gotta deploy it. Uh, otherwise you're burning money. That money needs to go into the pipeline to grow. Yeah, totally agree. That's right. And then you diversify your uh, portfolio of borrowing so that no individual or no sector can control the debt that you've got and therefore effectively can control the business that you're running. And, and do you see that debt exposure is an, an now a major challenge for the industry? Well, I, think I know based, we're having a discussion yeah, about it, but I would based say... Based on what we it, heard earlier, almost yeah. certainly, because we, it, it, based on what we heard at the outset of the day, you know, inflation rates are are high, higher than um, they've been for a long time, 30 years, I think was the phrase, uh, with the anticipation that they're unlikely to be short term, which means we're going to see um, interest rates rise. And if interest rates rise, those with a high debt burden are going to struggle more than they're struggling today. So now is probably the time for uh, those with debts to be looking at them and saying, if 
interest rates were to go up by 100 basis points or 150 basis points over the next five years, what does that do to my profitability? And how can I secure that in the same way they would secure the price of, um, uh, of other elements of their business going forward? Um, how do I secure that cost into my P&L and balance sheet? And they should be looking at it now because when interest rates have gone up, it's difficult to go back to your lenders and say, well, you know, I wonder if I could renegotiate now. Now is the time to do it when there's the opportunity to go and seek, as, uh, as we've heard, a diversified portfolio of debt. And Denki, what do you I think? Agree with, I agree with Mark. Uh, you can't beat the principle of the business. Interest, if interest rates are going to rise, they are going to rise. Uh, institution that got the money, but bottom line, you got to get you got to in, uh, get a bridging loan. You got to increase the term on that. You can't beat interest rate rise. All you can do is try and help the help the help the asset class or the ownership to get better performance uh, performances by extending the term. Well, I guess when you look at uh, Times coverage of EB, of uh, say, of EBITDA to debt or to interest, you would also say that uh, with an inflationary situation. If demand continues, which after all is supposed to be what's driving the inflation in the first place, uh, I'm sorry to keep talking about hotels, but it's the easiest one for me, but uh, you would say that, well, our occupancy will go up, our average room rate will go up, our EBITDA will go up, I know our costs will go up as well, but we could maintain the equilibrium. Uh, as it is, where you wouldn't really need then to have to restructure because you're covering yourself. But what we heard earlier, interestingly, was the cost of labour is going to go up significantly more than the average cost. So your of expenses go up a lot more than yeah. others. Yeah, I can imagine. So, you know, have also Mark, been... sorry, go ahead, please. So, Mark, Mark's got a valid point. It will go up. But having said all that, I personally believe the answer is to stretch. Uh, stretch the term low, stretch the, stretch the term. You can't beat rise in heat, light and power, labour costs or, uh, or interest rates. The only way, extend, extend the period, soften it. Because at the end of the day, uh, uh, you've got you've to ensure that the lender can pay you back. In order to do that, he's got to make money. Uh, yeah. uh, and to make money, he's got to get a long, longer term. No, indeed. And Dinky, question, my question on that is, if you extend the loan, in theory, you're going to impact the volatility. You impact the volatility, the return is to the institution needs to go higher, unless you can provide collateral or de-risk the volatility. So how do, you, how do you balance that? How do you provide greater comfort to the lender that volatility isn't going to increase as a result of the loan extension? Well, you know, um, I don't want a lender to put a rope around my neck at the end of the day in terms of as much as uh, you pledge a balance sheet of forward trading P&Ls to them, you, it's, it's got to be a hybrid between interest rate and forward looking P&Ls at the end of the day. And I think as you perform, you can always start clearing debt earlier than before. But don't, don't stifle the lender, the, the borrower. Let, give, him, give him room to, pay, to make money to pay you back. And Dinky, I was going to ask as we conclude, uh, it would be very interesting to hear just a bit about your main activities uh, with your own organisation and uh, what kind of structures you're putting together in relation to assisting people to set up their businesses or to evolve and expand their businesses. You know, Joe, I'll tell you, we've just done our, our own, a brand out of Switzerland called Revere in Dubai. Uh, up in Switzerland, the app of the ski resorts, we took them out to Dubai, created a hybrid product at the four-star luxury element, and uh, we are happy. We're six months into operation. Dubai has, uh, has bounced back. We're running 100% occupancy today. That's what, not, it's not only us, the entire city is running 100% at the moment. So I think we, we're happy to see if people investing. Our investors, who we talk to, are, are very bullish in Dubai and in the UAE. We, we're looking at products, but we are we trying to bring more of real estate play in you know, hospitality. I'm a believer of hybrid uh, because that de-risks uh, uh, you know, dependency on one particular revenue generating artery. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm a believer that the industry is, is looking promising. It's coming back. People want to travel. I see numbers coming up. I see uh, Southeast Asia opening. All right. uh, we got to steadily and cautiously uh, open the markets and yeah. be positive in our thinking. This is one industry that is there to stay. It's there to stay. It, it, it is about, um, again, 
keep retaining retaining manpower, holding, um, keeping them with you because uh, it costs a lot bringing them back and retraining and motivating them. So we, in all the businesses that we run or we manage for owners in the region, we haven't uh, advocated retrenchments. Uh, we said fine tune, maybe comp and benefits, but hold your staff. And we see that benefiting now. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Mark, so, Mark, Mark including, including, remarks. including remarks. No, I totally no, agree. I, totally I think, agree. That's, uh, I think that's, that's right. And that's right. And we can see the, we can storm, see is the storm is coming. And I think the institutions, think the institutions that, look that look now as how best to protect, to themselves, protect themselves from the storm, from the storm particularly around, particularly the, cost around the cost of finance, are going to do better, than, to do better than those that wait for the storm to hit and then look to refinance at that point. And I guess like all storms, it will pass. It will pass. How much time in the meantime is what we're all worried about. Dinky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And Mark, thank you as well. Really, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.